And this camp forum is hosted by um, uh, a lot of our Minneapolis-based community organizations, MIGZ, where I work. Um, we provide a strong survey support that nurtures the educational, social, economic, and cultural development of their community. Uh, SARE works to give Latina communities a voice in public policy and decision making, and Central Tyrone Guzman is committed to the well being of Latin families through providing a holistic approach to education, health, and forms. So um, there's uh, three candidates from the at large uh, seat uh, Sonia Emmerich, Colin Beachy, um, and Lisa Shetty. Here. And then um, the District 5 candidates are Gloria Lyra and Lori Mondale. Uh, and then Carrie Jo Felder, um, she was unable to make it tonight. She has COVID. So I will be reading her answers um, that she sent. So um, she is participating, but just not with us today. And then our moderator for this evening is Shafi, and he's the executive director and founder of the Somali Action Alliance. And it's an organization dedicated to civic and social change. And prior to becoming the executive director of the Somali Action Alliance, Shafi was an outstanding community leader and professional community organizer and has led countless efforts to help global engagement on civic participation and electoral organizing, including practicing a democracy that spread from three continents, continents, Europe, Canada, and America. So thank you for moderating. And um, let's get started. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizers who made this event to happen tonight. I know many other public schools have been struggling for a long time to see this kind of coalitions going together, candidates on the, on the spot. So thank you for organizers. And also thank you for the candidates who I know it was not easy for when you not only work daytime and also campaigning for the event, this kind of event that shows us. Uh, you have committed for what you're doing and what you're trying to do. So my work will be asking questions, and most of is going to be three uh, selected questions. And I'm sure you have all those questions here. And, uh, and after that, uh, each of candidates will be uh, asked to state your uh, uh, statement will be will last only 90 seconds. We give you 90 seconds to say whatever, uh, whatever you are, and you stand for, and uh, let me assume one for this office. Second, also, we we'll start questions, and then each question, uh, we expect you to respond within 60 seconds. And after that, we'll be all, after we will ask you all these selected six questions, we'll give an opportunity for the audience to also uh, ask their questions. And if each, uh, equally will be same, and uh, the answer will be last in only 60 seconds. So uh, I'm sure we have to make sure the time will close and, uh, and we have some time keepers in the house who will remind us if we pass one second. And uh, thank you also for, for all of us. Thank you for that. So after, I think as we know, this forum tonight is uh, mostly is academics. Uh, special education on multilingual levels. And uh, we'll begin with the first question. And uh, we, we, uh, we're expecting all of you will, be, will have the same equal questions. So then uh, we're we expecting you to respond. The, the first question will be if elect, uh, what, changes, what changes to, uh, to policies and practices will work with your, will work with your colleagues to put in place to ensure equitable academic, academic outcome to students who have been historically and systemically underserved by the school system. So those are the questions, the first question that I wanted to respond for each of you. And my colleagues, please, my left hand, please, I'll be more uh, hi everyone, my name is Colin Beachy. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just think one thing, uh, I'm, I'm a special education teacher right now in, in Minneapolis, and I still think one thing that we can do as far as taking some of these policies is this over-reliance that we have on some of the standardized testing that we're doing. And so, if, if you follow the history of what standardized testing is, who created it, why they made some of the changes that they've done, 
it's, it's this whole system that's kind of been put in place to sort of advance the white supremacy culture that we all kind of are living in. And so when we have a, a, a population of students that we have, and we have a majority of students who are, who are, who are a large number of students who are, who are people of color, we need to understand their cultural backgrounds and things where they are coming from. And understand that sometimes not everybody works with that Eurocentric model where we're just doing everything on paper and pencil. We've got to find other ways that we can evaluate our students, making sure that we're having some programming that is a little bit more um, uh, uh, project management or project based, project focused acti activities that you can do. Because there are other ways that we can evaluate our students without just having to sit down and having them just take those standardized tests. Not everybody learns the same way. You can't judge someone's intelligence just by, based on one test. So that's one thing that I'd like to really tap as work on, is to move away from some of that. Could you please spend uh, who you are? Oh, did you do all that too? Okay. okay, all right, sorry, I didn't know if that was until the end. Um, Colin Beachy, I'm sorry, um, I'm a special education teacher. I work at Transition Plus in South Minneapolis. It's on Lake Street and 21st Street. We're in the building. Um, it's the Center for Adult Learning. Uh, there's two schools in our building. The second school is the, um, is our adult education. Uh, I'm starting my eighth year of teaching, my 21st year in Minneapolis, my 21st year of teaching overall. Uh, most of it has been here in Minnesota, kind of traveled back and forth to the West Coast. But uh, ever since I've been back here in Minnesota, um, been teaching here at Transition Plus. Um, being a teacher is just who I am. It's who my family is. We have a family of teachers. Parents are both teachers. Four of the five kids are teachers. Nieces and nephews are teachers. Both my grandmas are teachers. Uncles and aunts are teachers. It's just what we do. So I have a strong passion for public education. And I'm really concerned about some of the efforts that are going on to privatize our public schools. And so I really want to make sure that we are doing what we can to ensure that we are providing our, pu our public school teachers and our public school families and our students, making sure that we're giving them the resources that they need. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, our second candidate, please. Hi. So, um, state your name. Or? Got it. My name is Sonia Emmerich. I am a lifelong Minneapolis resident, and I'm a graduate of Minneapolis Public Schools, and I am also a parent of two, including an MPS rising first grader who has been receiving special education services in the district since he was two years old. Um, the time that I've spent advocating for my own child um, who receives special education services has been increasingly more fraught, and um, we've experienced increasingly more insurmountable barriers to equitable access to education. And through that work over the years, I have gotten to know a lot of other folks, a lot of other families who are also facing seemingly insurmountable barriers when it comes to helping their kids, the kids that they care for, having equitable access to education. And so I thought if I'm gonna fight this hard, I'm not just gonna do it for my own kid. Um, I have a vision that I would like to help execute where stakeholder groups partner across the district to ensure that our historically most underserved students have access to the education that they need. In particular, I believe that one of the most effective ways to interrupt the school to prison pipeline is to ensure that every student in our district is effectively taught to read. Thanks. Um, and as far as the question about um, academic equity, I think the first thing that our, the first focus is that we need to make sure that our instructional practices are efficacious and grounded in what we know scientifically about how people learn. For instance, literacy we know is not um, evolutionarily prescribed like oral communication is. It has to be directly taught, right? Once we make sure that we have efficacious instruction, we need to make sure that instruction is culturally responsive. Students need teachers who look like them. That means we need more teachers of color in our district. And we need everyone to be supported to dismantle the belief gap that there are some kids who are capable of learning this instruction and not because that's untrue and many of us are holding the implicit bias we're not aware of. And finally, we need to work together to interrogate how we execute exclusionary discipline. We need to build out alternatives so that students and teachers are supported to have kids stay in their classroom so they can, they can learn that culturally sustaining and effective instruction. Thanks. Thank you. I just have to say one thing is that you, you need Spanish uh, translation to quick Spanish if you're online or on Zoom. 
My name is Lisa Shefty. I'm a citizen of the Red Lake Nation. Um, I grew up here in South Minneapolis in a little community many of you might have heard of. It's called Little Earth of United Tribes. I'm a, um, it's not a reservation. A lot of people think it is. It's a community where um, um, a lot of Native people live in South Minneapolis. And I am a graduate of South High. And um, <clears throat> I've dedicated my work towards equity, inclusion, um, and also um, working with community to make sure that um, solutions are community informed, that our voices are heard, and that um, so solutions are Solutions can't be made without us. We need to be a part of the planning from the beginning um, at, towards the end, and um, we can't do that without bringing those folks together and doing the active efforts on how to get engage them and bring them to the table. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and for the question now, um, in my work, um, I used to work at Children's Minnesota, um, and I was a health equity specialist, and I was able to bring tools. I love to bring in tools that are created by the community. One tool that I use and love all the time is called the Racial Equity Impact Assessment, and it's from Voices for Racial Justice, and it's right down the street in Minneapolis. And what I do is try to show folks how to utilize and access a tool that's already been created and that's available so that they can make informed decisions regarding race, racial equity. And then one way to do that is, if we're talking about Native students, then we have to name them. If we're talking about Black students, we have to name them. In order to eliminate any disparities our communities face, we have to be able to name the, name the, the name what we want to um, eliminate the disparity and we have to be able to design the interventions around that with community information. So I would utilize and bring tools like that to the table so that we can try to make, thank you. <laughs> Director of Minoba Disawin Wellness Clinic. Um, it's owned and operated by Red Lake Nation, which is also the tribe that I'm from and an enrolled member of. Um, very honorable position for me to take on um, to be able to hear stories and um, do this work of leadership in the community. I'm just very thankful for that. Um, and then also I have two children. Um, they've attended Bancroft and Hiawatha Pow schools. Um, so I've been able to experience firsthand some of the challenges and some of the strengths, including um, the amazing diversity that we have amongst our student body um, as a strength. And, um, and then also the challenges of trying to um, get special education services for um, one of my children. And um, so that's been something that's also very important to me. Um, I did spend two years um, as a member of the American Indian Parent Advisory Council and also a co-chair on that um, committee and was able to learn a lot about um, some of the challenges that the district and the school board is facing and um, believe that I can bring um, both strong leadership um, with seven years of um, directing experience that I have, and also um, a fresh um, creative um, perspective as well. Question. Yeah. Yes, the question. Um, so I have also um, had quite a bit of experience in, in my seven years of um, directing and leading um, equity committees um, to help uh, further uh, both personnel and um, recruiting policies um, and then is um, 
policies that are specific to clients and uh, how we um, how we provide care within um, healthcare systems. So that has been something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and one of the reasons as well that I was on APAC, um, wanting to make sure that um, that there is equity and access to education. Um, I do know that um, some of the literacy and math, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm running out of time here, 10 seconds, ah, okay. Um, so I'll just wrap it up with uh, and say that um, I, I do know of um, some evidence-based practices, but also believe that it's important to um, see what's working with um, the underserved um, students as well and not just what's um, been rubber stamped and, and maybe tested and approved on um, Caucasian students. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lori Norville. I'm running for the District 5 school board seat. I am an MPS parent, Minneapolis Public School parent, and I'm also a former educator for Minneapolis Public Schools. We know that we have got some systemic racist issues within our school system, and I will work tirelessly to address those. We have historical and contemporary inequities within our system. These inequities disproportionately impact our students, particularly our students of color and our indigenous students. My family and I moved here 10 years ago, and I've, my kids have gone through Minneapolis Public Schools. I've got one who's still in MPS at Washburn, um, and I've worked for MPS for eight years. And in our time here, I realized when we came here, we moved here, we chose Minneapolis Public Schools for a variety of reasons. And I want other people to choose that. And I want Minneapolis Public Schools to be the best public school system in the state. And I know we can get there. I know we're not there right now, and we've got some things to work on. So I've got three things I think that we need to work on. The first one is we need to retain and recruit educators and families, and we need to focus on our educators of color. We need to rebuild the trust and relationships with our district with the board and with the community, and we need to practice student-centered decision-making processes while we're also stabilizing our programs. Our school board needs the voice of a recent teacher. It also needs the voice of a parent, but it, most of all, it needs your voice. As part of the Safe and Stable School Slate and endorsed by the Teachers Union, I will lift your voice to the school board and to the district. Thank you. Question? Um, okay. so. I, I've, I've been a teacher, and so one of the things that I, I saw, I, I was one of the people who left in December, or left mid-year, I left last December. And one of the things that I think we really need to work on is greater stability within our schools, with um, school systems, with our staffing, with our curriculum. And some of those things that I think will help us get there is making sure that we are regularly practicing well-researched um, processes when we're looking at curriculum, when we're looking at programs, so we're consistently doing that. We're advocating for culturally relevant, meaningful professional learning opportunities because we want all of our educators to be able to educate all of our children. And we want to make sure that we're ensuring the implementation of that culturally relevant curriculum that we already do have at every single site for every single child. We need to listen to the needs of our students, our families, and our educators so that we can give them what they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, also we have a very school how to school she to ask the first very interesting. Okay. Um, this is an exciting question to consider. How do we decide to approve policy? We use our experience and knowledge and our interactions with diverse members of the community, not just our Excuse me, can I be part of your Zoom? You have to get closer. Get closer. Zoom can I hear you? Oh, stand up. Stand up. Okay. We bring these questions to the table and we make decisions when it comes to ensuring equ equitable academic outcomes. The best way to do, for us to do that would be to fund our schools and staff our buildings. We make sure our teachers are trained in evidence-based curricula, including SEL programs. We know that giving students access to teachers with the skills and experience that help students learn is of utmost importance. At this moment, MPS is understaffed. As of August 16th, MPS had over 270 openings. We struggle to retain educators we have. Our educators of color are leaving this district by choice 
at a disproportionate rate than their white counterparts. If our students are hungry, we don't, don't have stability in their home life and school life, they can't learn. MPS educators are underpaid, and as a result, we'll have hundreds of educators who have left MPS to go work in other fields and other districts that pay more. We cannot perpetuate systemic harms that impact the learning conditions our students navigate and simultaneously say we value equity. MPS educators are also MPS parents, are also MPS community members. We must deepen investment in restorative and live affirming life affirming practices. Lower class sizes add mental health supports, have arts in every school. That's a public good. So, goal number one of new MPS strategic planning states every student achieves their full potential to equal access to programming that academically features and connects learning in school with the students and experiences at home. So, that was the second question I will give you, please. Alright, so, um, so first of all, with this, with this question, um, how would you hold students accountable? I guess I would rather approach this that if there's a school that's not achieving whatever it is that they need to do, how are we going to be reaching out to them and giving them the resources that they need? Find out why is it they're failing. We need to talk with their teachers. We need to talk with their SEAs. We need to speak with their parents. And obviously, we need to talk with the principal as well. See if there's something that we can do to provide them the resources rather than just think about going and holding people accountable and, and throwing out some punishments. Um, the one thing that we can also do, um, I encourage a lot of people who are parents, especially if you have children in school, to start thinking about joining your students with your school site council. On the site council, we are working a lot. We're starting to work a lot more closer with some of our parents that have some, let you have some more direct responsibility and direct input as to what programming you'd like to see at your school and how you'd like to have build the culture of your school. And so then that way, when our parents come in, then you can have conversations with us. Again, I'm a special education teacher. A lot of times what works with us is we're doing, a, we're doing something, working with a student here in class, we then turn around top of the parent about this is how you continue doing that with them at home. So. Thank you. I uh, happen to be a pretty big fan of our new strategic plan, and when I was watching the Committee of the Whole school board meeting uh, just this week, I was very relieved as an MPS parent to see something that had goals attached to it, that had metrics attached to it. I think that we need to be pushing out assessment data with frequency and transparency to our families, to the community, but I also think that we need to be able to take that high level systems data and dig down into it to address areas where we need support or intervention on a really granular level. And I think that that's where we need to be relying on um, Director Francis and the MPS Climate and Culture team. I sit on the site council for the um, school where my child is enrolled and we have some equity issues that we're trying to address and that team's been great to us. Um, we need to use our associate superintendents to address issues at the student level, family level, classroom level. That data has to get us granularly to address every issue that comes up so that we can be accountable to our students and families. Thank you. So the, the question was uh, accountability to the school and the states. Huh? So the question is accountability for strategic planning. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think um, for me, when I'm thinking about accountability um, and holding the district or the schools accountable for student achievement, I think about engagement with parents. But coming from a community where um, the parents and students are struggling with a lot of social determinants of health, poverty, access issues, um, folks that are experiencing out-of-home placement, students who are experiencing out-of-home placement, it's really hard to engage parents when they have a lot of social determinants impacting how they access schooling. So for that, I would always look to making the meetings more accessible for community engagement, such as there's after school programs and community centered programs that focus on how to engage the parent in our specific communities and um, how to elevate their voices and then um, 
being able to do that work alongside with community and partnership truly. Thank you. Thank you. So when, when I think about um, how to hold uh, the district accountable and the different schools, um, I think about um, dashboard or work plans. Um, I'm glad to hear that you know there are outcomes um, laid out, but I do think that the schools are unique enough where, um, and they have both unique in their strengths and also in their needs, um, and think that we would need to um, work with the schools um, or have them work on specific um, work plans that identify how they would um, want to measure um, success, success, excuse me. Um, thank you. Hi. So for accountability, um, first of all, I want to say I think accountability is a good thing. In my time as a teacher, I was held accountable every single day for what my students learned and for what they did in my classroom, and I think that's a good thing. I don't think we need to shy away from that at all. Um, that accountability, though, what it looks like is support. It looks like resources, which I think Colin also mentioned. It, it, that's what it looks like, giving those classrooms, those schools, those teachers, those resources that they need, the support that they need, and we don't know what they need if we don't talk to them. We have got to talk to the educators and find out what they need. We've got to talk to students and families, find out what it is they need so that we can determine what are those resources, what are those supports. We need to make sure that we have systems in place for sustainable accountability so that when we're talking about accountability, we're constantly making progress forward. We are reaching this goal, then we're going on to the next one. And so we need to make sure that we're doing that. And again, I mentioned earlier careful research in anything that we're adopting. We've got to make sure that we are vetting that out. We've got to make sure that we're doing the best for our students. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's move to our Oh yeah, the other. <laughs> the answer will be through the this. Uh, culturally, culturally re relevant teaching continues to be a powerful model for schools, meeting students where they are at, getting to know them and making them feel included, welcomed, and reflected in the curricula as well as the so-called hidden curricula, the teacher and staff banter, the norms, rules, or expectations, the clubs and activities, and the racial demographics of their teachers. This is not new, it has only been deleted already. So our job is to make sure that we re-enter and reprint our histories and attributes to the USA and find the respect that each ethnicity that makes up the USA deserves. A favorite strategy of teachers is to tell students a bit about themselves, and this is fine, but it is not enough. It can even widen the space that many students have learned to go between themselves and school teachers. We learn best when we are in a safe and supportive environment. Zaretta Hammond, Hammond notes in culturally responsive teaching and the brain. The brain seeks to minimize social threat and maximize opportunities to connect with others in the community. Thank you. So let's move to the third question about our, our dis uh, dis disability students. Years ago, the district itself, they pursued more inclusion for students who have disabilities. Much more still remains. How would you how, how would you define inclusion for students with disabilities? Yeah, All right. So uh, inclusion, we don't do too much of that at, at my school where we're at. But that's simply because my school is an entirely special education program school. We don't have general education in our school. But in our general general education schools, when you're talking about inclusion, we're talking about trying to get our special education students access to the same general education programming as their peers have. And so there's different ways that we can all go about this. The thing that we have to caution things about this is this is we have to go back to talking about working with the teachers and the teachers and the parents, making sure that we're working hand in hand and having come, uh, um, good communication, real honest communication about what's happening with your child. Not, inclusion does not necessarily work for every child. It might be a good idea to put them in that class, but if we haven't, if we haven't been able to have the time to spend with that child and make sure that they are going to be successful in that inclusion class, there's really no point in sending them there if we're sending them there unprepared. So we want to make sure that we're, that we're um, really given the opportunity to do that. One thing that we need to do at our schools, high schools, elementary schools as well, these resource rooms where most of the students, uh, the students with disabilities have to go, we've got to make some big improvements on those as well. Thank you. 
when I saw how this question was worded that we tried to do inclusion a few years ago, I was pretty angry because no, we didn't. No, we didn't. We tried to do mainstreaming a few years ago, which is nothing like inclusion. It's actually really harmful to do that to students, to teachers across the district. We have not tried to do inclusion. I will let everyone here know, if you don't, that the leading technical support for inclusion in the country is the Thai Center out of the University of Minnesota. Who's heard of it? Do we partner with them? Why are we not getting that technical support? Students belong, every student deserves the opportunity to learn with their general education peers. It's federally guaranteed, it is the law, and if a student is not included, the onus is on the school and on the district to include that student. It is never on the student to perform as non-disabled so they can earn a spot in that class. <coughs> I think inclusion is giving Sonia more time to speak on it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because it's about honoring diversity and not ignoring it. And inclusion is about listening to the hard truths about where we miss and about how we can show up better. And I think that like, unless you, um, it's hard to talk about inclusion for students with disabilities if we haven't had that experience directly. But I, what I do know about for inclusion is like, it can't become another word that we use to gaslight folks who need access and support and for students who need access and support. And I think that sometimes like within our systems and our schools and other hospital systems, we, we get really good at defining words. And, but we don't, we're not very good at showing up. Thank you. So for me, um, inclusion is um, what we've been hearing from everybody, but um, also I would include, um, inclusion might be uh, just having more time with peers who are also experiencing the same challenges that they're experiencing. So that might not necessarily be in the school that they're in. Um, so one of the things that came to mind for me was building a community um, outside of the school um, that, that people are in. Um, and then also um, just looking at the ways in which, and this was really powerful here from Sonia, hearing um, her experience, but I'm also curious what others are, are experiencing as far as what are their limitations in, uh, or barriers to accessing um, or to being included and would, would like to hear from the schools on how um, we can help to support in improvements there. Thank you. Um, I would define inclusion as we are providing all students with the opportunity to be in as many gen ed, general education classes as possible to further their skills, to learn their skills, to enrich their learning, um, whether that is a specialist class or whether that is um, an advanced math class. Every child should have that opportunity to be in the class that is going to challenge them, that is going to help them grow and learn. And I think that that should be um, determined by a meeting with the student and the parents and the educators to find out what are the best, um, what is the best avenue for those students. Um, in my own experience, I've had students be in my classes. I've taught general ed education classes and I've taught math and I've taught a cooking class. And I've had kids be in my class with an aid, without an aid. And what we do is we give them an entry point. We give them a way to come into that class, to be a part of that class, to participate and learn the skills that everyone else is learning. Thank you. So let's move to our fourth question, which also focuses on. Oh, I'm talking for Carrie Jo Felder. That's who I'm speaking for. I should have said that in the beginning. Um, the pain and frustration felt by students, families, and teachers is, is real. These three priorities will not erase a record of, record of suffering and exclusion, but they will make a difference immediately. 
Staffing, for example, Henry and I currently have 17 open licensed positions. Staff resigned this week. We need staff, period. This is communication with families. We need to help families feel their child is valued and seen and welcome, not, not in spite of their differences from the mainstream student, but because of reduced class sizes so a teacher has a chance of forming the relationships and getting to know the student's strengths and areas of development, their full personhood, academic, and otherwise. Um, to do, we can't skate on what is right. We need to give um, SPED's staff time to familiarize, familiarize themselves with all the students in their purview, then meet with contact instructors to review the IEPs, 504s, or PLPs. Yes, ma'am, I will be second person to make an addition. I won't forget to read it. Let's focus on, uh, we'll, I mean, shift our gear to uh, special education. And uh, our fourth question is special education assessments and the service are not responsive to different cultures and groups. Uh, for example, black students are overrepresented among the students receiving special education services and are heavily classified as having emotional behavior dis uh, disorder and as a result they are given the innocent the innocence uh, accumulation. What changes can be made to ensure special education assessment and services recognize different culture and uh, identities? And I will begin with you and the second so I just remembered I've been talking with my mask on. I've been uh, I do that all day with my students. So I'm sorry about that if you couldn't hear me with my mask on before. Um, we heard something. We had a question earlier here about inclusion. We've heard people talking about culturally responsive teaching. I'm the equity lead at my school, and so a lot of the equity training that we're doing with with my students is to talk about a little bit about the Eurocentric cultures that we live in, the Eurocentric trainings that we have, the Eurocentric curriculum that we have, and a lot of times some of these hidden biases that you have are responsible for some of these things, why you're feeling like someone is being put into an EBD class, why are, are black students are, are more overrepresented in that, in that class. They're speaking louder, they're speaking too loud, they're you know, up out of their seat and they're not moving around, therefore they must be EBD. You know, let's, um, you know, we have to give our teachers a little bit more um, culturally trained, so that they understand the cultures that we're dealing with a little bit more. And we need people from our from the community. We need people from our own teaching staff that can that can go and um, come and provide some of that training for us. There's also just in the academic part of it. There are five simple steps that we're asking all of our teachers to do in all of their academic program in all of their academic programming. There's five things that can help with some more culturally responsive training into your programming, matching the student population that's sitting right in front of you. I wish I had more time to talk about that. So, <laughs> so my second one is going to be the response, uh, This is an interesting question, and I have a lot of feelings about it due to my own life experiences. With that said, I'd love to hear from our black SPED professionals and have them outline what the actual criteria should look like to put a black child on an IEP. We have to be very careful with our children. This is their whole life ahead of them, and I think we need to rewrite re what, the, what that looks like and how they get there. We know black children are over-identified as our English language learners. This is part of our nation's ugly legacy, which assessments can help avoid over-identification or misidentification. Would be one of the, would be one that identifies student strengths and perhaps thinking and reasoning abilities, like the non-verbal non abilities test, something that is used in Robinsdale schools. Using innocence as a goal for every child in the classroom can have a dramatic impact on both their behavior and the academic engagement. The innocence can function as a tool of liberation for our children and for teachers as well. Can you make sure to project so that the interpreter can hear you? Oh, okay. I'm reading. A conversation that I don't hear happening widely in this district is about the intersection of the systemic oppression, racism, and the systemic oppression, ableism. And in order to address this issue, we need to be looking at both of these forms of oppression and how they interact with each other and dismantle them in concert with each other. So one thing that I think about is that we use something called federal settings in Minnesota to describe um, how much of what percentage of a day a student would spend in general education versus in a segregated setting. 
And what we found when we requested data from the Minnesota Department of Education is that Minneapolis Public Schools, black students are overrepresented by over two times in segregated settings, okay? Now when we think about segregated settings, that is away from general education, either in a self-contained classroom or in a whole different building, those are hyper-surveilled, those are behavioral compliance focused, segregated settings that are grooming for the prison system. This is where the school to prison pipeline is starting with our kids as young as preschoolers. And we are seeing predictably our black students and indigenous students overrepresented here. So this question triggered my historical trauma as a native person. So I just wanna like recognize for black parents and students that a question like this doesn't get to the deeper issues of historical trauma and the impacts that continue historical trauma and continued colonization of native people and black people have on our current society right now. And in Minneapolis, we know this more than anything with um, the disparities impacting black families and native families. And also, um, I'm angry that we have this data and there's not money, there's not a plan, it's not being addressed. Because we know what type, we know exactly what this type of di this type of segregated diagnosis, what it does to our communities, and it, it's created to destroy our communities, starting from the time they're children, all the way throughout their entire school system. <sighs> Sorry, it's really emotional. Thank you. Thank you. So um, there are community organizations out there that do provide culturally responsive assessment and services and um, including the agency that I work for, we do provide pediatric mental health services and, um, and all mostly by Native American providers. So those services do exist. Um, I, I must say um, that I think that we can do better um, within the school district to access those programs. I could list a whole slew of barriers that um, take place that prevent um, children from accessing these types of services. Not, not intentionally, but I think well um, uh, thought out plans that you know are not the, in the best interest of children and families um, are actual barriers. So I, I would just say that there are um, services out there and I think a big part of how we would resolve this would be to not only bring um, those services necessarily into the school, but also for to provide trainings um, for staff and for teachers. The first thing we need to do is we need to recognize the variety of cultures that we have in Minneapolis public schools and in our city. Um, we need to recognize that. We need to recognize the differences and celebrate those differences. And we also need to recognize that we operate in a white normative culture. Colin called it Eurocentric, right? We do. We need to. We need to recognize that, and we need to unlearn it. We've got to have professional learning opportunities for our educators so that they can unlearn that. So that when they are in a situation, when they're with children in their classroom they can reevaluate themselves and ask, why am I reacting this way? And did I react this way because of the color of this child's skin? And if this child had done it, would I have done the same thing? It's a hard place to be, but we have got to be vulnerable, we've got to be open and learning to do that. We've got to, um, we've got to make sure that we're looking at our assessment processes. A lot of them are outdated. We've got to have a variety of assessment processes where it's not just pencil paper, it's not just one way, because we know that everybody learns in different ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let us, I think we have two more questions to go uh, as uh, pre-selected questions. Question number five. Could you please share with us what you know about the English language learners and the multilingual uh, yeah, um, otherwise known as 
uh, Jamie and KP down there in the hall. So um, our um, ELL and our uh, multilingual program, what, what, what goes on at our school anyway, and I believe this is pretty similar at, at, at a lot of these other schools, and so they have, we have six hours for the day, so our two English language learners, have, they each have three classes that they teach, and then there's the other three hours during the day, they're taking time either pushing in students in another class or pulling students out to work on some specific one-on-one -on -one things. A lot of things that they're doing in this class is a good thing for these students to try and get them to do a lot of that practicing being able to speak in English, but they're also getting that time to speak in their own native language when they're in that class. They're grouped up according to the language that they speak to try and make things a little bit easier on everybody. And again, it's a lot of things where they're bringing people in from the community as well to help share some of the resources with them, help them navigate some of the things that are, um, how to help get the driver's license, how to help uh, navigate a lot of those different um, things, how to navigate MPS a lot of the times. And then they're able to kind of work and do some things with their parents. Um, there's just some concern right now about the, about the opt-in busing program that we have. And I'll have to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is Carrie's, uh, Carrie Joe's response. <laughs> what I know is these students are some of the bravest students in our buildings. What I also know is they are not being served either according to the letter of the law or according to our own moral compass. This is a historic trend in American schooling, and in spite of legitimate advances and progress, we can and must do better. I also know we should listen to our parents. Many times, students are put into ELL classes, even if they are born in the US and parents do not want that. Parents know their children, their students best and should listen to them. I know that language is a deep core part of what makes up our identity. This is philosophical, linguistic, biological, and just practical. I know that English-only programs and policies can cause great harm. I know that we have not staffed these departments as well as we should. I know that many people, including educators, don't quite understand what inclusive instruction or sheltered instruction looks like. I know that many of these students fall into cracks. We should do uh, more dual immersion programs throughout the district as they have a huge impact on the outcome of students' grades. So not dissimilarly for, from special education, um, English language learner and multilingual programs exist because they're a federally guaranteed right, because language is considered a civil right. And so these are mandated programs that all of our students who are multilingual or emerging multilingual students deserve access to programming that supports them as bilingual learners, right? And I know that in MPS we have literally dozens I read somewhere a hundred languages represented, which blew my mind because what a cool form of diversity and what an asset to have in our district. We know that this, these programs can be leaders for equity in our district because of the mechanisms that are required in order for students to have whole identities as bilingual or emerging bilingual students. But we also know that we're leaving these um, students behind in terms of success, in terms of academic success, and in terms of feeling culturally affirmed in their schools. Um, I just want to apologize because I don't know as much as I should about English language learners or the program specifically, but I did grow up in South Minneapolis schools and I have been able to have, have friends and colleagues who have experienced that and have watched um, the struggles in classrooms. Um, and also, um, I think though that a lot of biases exist around um, second language um, learners um, in terms of like not really appreciating or respecting the fact that like folks with multiple languages have like, they're like smarter, right? <laughs> we know this. And they should be in excelling and we should be treating them like they're special. And I know as someone, um, I'm Anishinaabe and we work really hard to revitalize our languages because language is key and cornerstone to who we are as indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've had um, the pleasure of having my son in Bancroft, where in his pre-K class he had one of the teachers who spoke Spanish and he was in a 
Spanish immersion um, program prior to coming on to pre-K, um, and just, it was just awesome to see him enter that class and, and be, both be able to speak English with his peers and um, Spanish with uh, some of the kids who were further along in their Spanish, and, and just the fact that Bancroft offers that through all five years, I think is really incredible. Um, and the diversity there, I think, is just really special. Um, I wanted to say that, but also comment on the fact that um, we are also needing to learn Ojibwe uh, and through a much <laughs> more challenging route um, and uh, needing to uh, seek that out on our own and uh, purchase our own materials to learn, um, even though I do have a grandfather who um, is fluent um, and that did uh, stop with um, some of the boarding school uh, things that my family has experienced. Um, but I, I also want to just point out that, um, you know, a lot of Native folks are just, um, have had, a, a, you know, family members who did majority speak another language. So that's something really to consider when you're thinking about um, the Native learners that you have. So with our English language learner programs and our multilingual learner programs, we've got a, a wide variety. Um, we have our students in these programs, they have a wide range of, of where they come from, like newcomers, students who um, maybe only speak their native language and they've never been in school before to students who are in a dual immersion program. And a lot of times those students are all put into one classroom. I've had that experience in math classroom where I had a new student never had done school. She's trying to learn what, how to do school, how to be in class, how to ask to go somewhere or whatever, and also learn English as well. These programs also encompass um, English language development. They encompass the, encompass the dual immersion programs for Spanish and Hmong. And then they also include the world indigenous language programs too. So we've, we've got this really great opportunity um, to expand these programs and to make sure that we're meeting the needs for our bilingual students. So, thank you. Thank you. I think we are... We are at time. Yeah, we have the last guy, the last Do you want to continue? 5.55. We, the last question, yeah. let me just finish the, the last question. Okay. And then we, there are some online maybe questions and uh, others. So the last question, we have significant, uh, significant uh, disparities in uh, economic, uh, academic outcomes between students who speak English at home and students who speak English as a second language. What supports do you believe you need to be in place, uh, in place to improve the academic outcomes and uh, schools experience for students who do not speak English as their first language? So one of the first things that we do is we need, um, kind of like everywhere that we're in the school, we need some boots on the ground. Okay? We need people who can be, who, who are um, native language speakers who can be in our school and working with our students, either capacity of being a teacher or being one of our support staff. We've got some of the best support staff in the entire state. Um, there needs to be some dedicated time. Uh, Jamie and I, when we're working with one of my students that's in my class, we have once a week, we sit down together and talk about what's going on in the week, where Muhammad is at, how he's um, managing everything in the classroom, and then together we're making sure that he's giving me the supports that I need so that when he's not there teaching in that classroom. So that dedicated time for us to be able to sit down and collaborate and work on those things and talk about those things are gonna be um, uh, a big improvement for what we've been, how we've been doing things before in the past. Now we've got that dedicated time to do so. So that's one of the supports that we can do. There's also a lot of new technology that's out there that I think we can invest in that can help a lot of our students as well when we don't have those speakers available for us in the classroom. Okay. Oh yes, our case spot. <laughs> I believe a big reason for our disparities is the historic legacy of prejudice along with our human biases. We are not great about seeing or welcoming or appreciating difference. With a largely white Christian workforce, this means many of our students are not seeing themselves or potentially feeling safe. One way for everyone to gain and build trust is by exploring multiple perspectives. 
This is another approach to studying and learning, one that explores more than one view of the same event, topic, experience. When we learn about something, we often hear a single perspective. However, one perspective cannot capture the totality of that thing, whatever the thing is. According to the website Teaching History, this practice is what scholars already do and what we should teach students to do. Oftentimes, a different story emerges when those multiple perspectives are put together. The result is enriched historical understanding. So a few years ago, MPS did this. They launched this program called the Parent Participatory Evaluation Process, which gathered um, perspectives from key stakeholder groups, including um, Latin, Hmong, Somali, Indigenous uh, parents, and I'm forgetting one, oh, black parents. Um, and so I looked back at that data because I wanted to hear those voices coming through, and I found that among Latin, Hmong, and Somali families, the feedback was the top for all three more culturally responsive family engagement. That is what was wanted and needed. And um, when, when there was another survey question that included indigenous families, we wanted to see more culturally responsive opportunities, more, more, more representation in our schools, including language learning in the languages that our students are speaking at home. Um, so I am going to let those voices be my guides because we have heard what is needed. Um, during my time at Children's, um, I like to work with interpreter services. And one of the biggest disparities that we saw, even with an institution that has a lot of resources, were like the lack of um, the lack of effort by putting resources where we clearly needed them, where the data showed us that we need them. We ask families and parents all the time in communities about what it is that they need. And we can find the data going back probably two decades where families have been telling us what they need and we haven't been able to invest in those solutions at all. But one of the biggest disparities that I saw is that sometimes we make our children we're making our, the children be the interpreters for their families. And we don't even think about what that causes, for, what the impacts are on those families and, um, and what situations we put them in. So I think that like one of the biggest things I would say to improve the academic outcomes is we need to invest in what the communities and families have named as solutions. what a lot of um, that's been said so far. I would just add um, that I, um, I don't know a lot about the interpretive services um, challenges that, um, that are out there, um, and I would love to learn more about that and just um, wanna put that out there that um, if anybody wants to work with me on that, I'd be happy to, um, but definitely see that as a top priority um, the data shows um, that that's a top priority. So, thank you. Thank you. I think one of the biggest supports that we've lost at some schools is um, the support from family liaisons. When I was working at Anthony Middle School, we had a family liaison, and um, and she was Somali, and so she could communicate with our Somali families. If they came in and needed an interpreter, we didn't have to rely on children. You're absolutely right about that and we didn't have to rely on students to do that interpretation. We have got, that, that was cut. You know, we've gotta make sure that those cuts aren't happening, um, that we are having those family liaisons at the schools because those are, those people are so valuable and maybe they're called community liaisons. Um, we've gotta make sure that we have dedicated time, I think Colin mentioned this, dedicated time for planning with those English language learner teachers and the general education teachers. When are they planning? And that has to happen on a regular basis. And we've got to have those English language learner supports in every single subject in content area. I taught math. We never got it. They, it went everywhere else. We never got it. And it was really difficult at times to try to give the support, to try to give what the students needed without that additional support. Thank you.
I think that uh, includes all the 6P uh, selected questions. Now we're giving an opportunity for also the audience. If you have any question, also we have some online participants also want to make sure we also take care of those focus for the online. So please, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. And also, when you want to speak, you can stand up, state, so you state your name and uh, your question, please. Yes, please. So some of the areas I think where that's going to be most effective for people to do that is going to be in some of the communities that we have. I know if they have some communities on the board right now, we may have the same ones. If we're elected, we may change some of those communities depending on the needs of, a, of what our students and what the public does. But just in general, those are really the four things that the board is sort of responsible for. So I know a lot of times being a teacher, I have teachers come up to me and saying, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? Well, that's not my responsibility as a board member. So it's important that we all understand really what the role is, what the board members can actually, are tasked with doing. Thank you. Um, this one, uh, Real quick, I totally agree with Colin about the role of the school board member. I think one of the biggest impacts we can make is going to be community engagement and talking about um, relaying what our communities need to the school board, um, other school board members to the district. Thank you so much. So that question was very important to like myself and my, my people my, whose background I came from. We heard about the school, who they are, what they do. We know the individuals are elected persons, but what they do. That was a good question, and thank you very much. So any other question from the audience, please? Yes, please, take your name and stand up, please. My name is Katie, I'm a MPS and a school nurse in the MPS. I am wondering if you have specific ideas about how to work more closely with um, the state and feds to get the funding gaps closed for special education across those students and for English language. Because my understanding is we're, I know there's a gap at the state level, but I also understand that we're not getting nearly what we're supposed to be get, getting from the federal level as well. So specific ideas. Yeah, this is, um, um, you're, you're right, it's about a $600 million gap. That, that's out there right now. And the um, federal government, the state government, is, is supposed to be paying up to about 40% of the special education costs. And then I don't think that they've gotten that close to doing so. So it's, it's, it, it, that is a big problem. That's something that Superintendent Giraffe even said. The, this, the state is, is just underfunding the schools just across the state. So what we need to be doing is working with our lobbyists. And when he's going out and doing some lobbying, we need to talk about who is he going and talking to and who is he spending his time with. Coming down and talking to some of our legislators who are right down here in the city, we're a relatively blue area of the city, or the state. So a lot of these educators kind of already agree with us. So what we need to do is find out where are those legislators in the outstate that are kind of pushing back against some of these reforms that we need. Who are some of the school boards that are in those districts? Reach out to some of those school board members. How can we help you? What conversations can we have with you? Who can we send to talk to your legislature to try and your legislature to try and help convince them to start fully funding our schools? Because this is not just a Minneapolis problem. This is a statewide problem. I'd like to just add to that that some of us are already working on relationships with those legislatures. And so as we're out campaigning, as we're out door knocking, we're doing that with some of those legislatures. Now they might be the Democratic legislatures who are already on board with us, but they're helping us make those connections so that we can continue that work. And I know Colin and I both have talked about how we plan to be there at the State House advocating because we know what it's like. We have gotten
got to fully fund special education and English language learner services so that when those are fully funded, then that, that money, that frees up money so that we don't have those cuts to the family liaison. We don't have cuts to dance class or something else. Yeah, I would just add um, some really great community work has been happening around this. I know the Multicultural Autism Action Network and the Autism Society of Minnesota, I sit on the board of directors for that organization, have been um, organizing across the state parents of students who receive special education services. I've testified to the legislature a number of times this year on this issue, and I think that we need that kind of community boots on the ground engagement, because the reality is even though our urban school district is disproportionately impacted by the special education and English language learner cross subsidy because of the students who are here in our district, this is something that's affecting people across the state. Um, and to Colin's point, we need to be doing outreach into other areas of the state. I think it would be great to be partnering with school districts and teachers unions across the state because I think that if we can make a concerted state effort to, I mean, they have our money. They have our money. We know where our money is. We have to go get it for our kids. Thank you. <coughs> so, and uh, let us have one, please. Okay. And you too. And uh, stay um, to Sorry, uh, my name is Jennifer Lawson Newman. I'm an out of towner, so to speak. I've been in the area for about three years. A good portion of that was spent um, not able to uh, contribute or be involved in the community. But um, I guess I should reach you <laughs> <laughs> wrong way. Um, and anyway, there are a couple of things. Well, first of all, I don't know who said it, but it does seem to me that a lot of problems can be overcome if each child knows that they are a hero. Mm -hmm. If they feel like they're a failure, then they can't learn. So uh, first job, make them teach a hero. Second job, teach them to think. Mm -hmm. So many people, my brother, I mean, we're smart people. We are educated. My brother uh, told me that when he got to college, he realized he didn't know how to think. And he went to schools, high school in Princeton, New Jersey, which is pretty up there. Um, anyways, it, it seems to me that that's the real thing. If a person can think, critically think, they can manage in just about anything. So anyway, then the next to, to the last part of my um, question is, where does the money come from? It seems to me everything that you all talked about could be solved with money. Mm -hmm. So. Where does you go to the legislature to beg for money? But where does that money come from? Is it from the state? If it's from the state, how do you get it? Who do you tax? If it's from the feds, what's going on there? So that's what I have to to question. Um, let's make it quick. Let's sure. Um, this fundraising has been something that I've been um, especially good at. Um, I would say uh, grant, looking to grants, looking to um, private or excuse me, philanthropic organizations um, for funding, I think would be um, essential in addition to state and federal funding um, because I think that there's a lot of people out there who probably would have their students in Minneapolis Public Schools if you know they felt they could contribute more or that there was um, maybe some of their interests were um, seen uh, and carried out through some funding as well. So I just think maybe more of a parent and community engagement that could bring in dollars would be important as well. Um, I just would like to respectfully disagree about the, the private money because if we're taking money from private organizations, then we're pulling into them and we are a public school system. And so our money has to be public money. Um, we don't want to end up having to um, adopt a specific curriculum or teach a certain way because someone gave us money. And we know that's what happens. When people give us money, when we have organizations give us money, private organizations, it's tied to something almost always. We've got to be careful about that. And so I, I just want to make sure we that. And I would just say that, you know, of course, that's always in the negotiation. So um, you're only as strong as your negotiation. Yeah, and um, the, 
think, yeah, to, to keep it along that lines with the, with the public money and the private money, like what we wouldn't want to do is have something like go to Target and now all of a sudden we've got the, the North High Library sponsored by Target. You know, and so um, in terms of the money, you know, it comes it comes with per, per pupil, and so that's part of the reason why we're having a financial deficit that we have because of the number of pre students that are leaving the state when they leave or leaving the district when they leave, the money goes with them. So that's part of the reason why we're having some of this problem. And to your first question that you were talking about, that is part of the training that we are also working on with our students that asset versus deficit linking right from the very start with when you're approaching these children. We're talking about the EL, the English language learning, and the multilingual learning. They like their, they're liking that term multilingual simply because, again, that's an asset way of thinking at it rather than the deficit way of calling them learners about something. Mm -hmm. So it's just that whole mindset of making sure that we are doing that asset versus deficit with our teachers. Let's take the last question from Willis. And uh, if there's anything online, I'm going to go back over this. Uh, yeah, we have another question from an audience member. Uh, Marin asks, uh, MPS has been through a lot of turmoil in the past few years. The pandemic, the strike, the financial woes have taken a toll. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of repairing relationships between families, students, staff, and administration. What steps would you like to take to repair these relationships? Gotta start talking to people. Again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how that how how that you know needs to be done specifically, but again, you tell me. You know, how, how, how do you want to communicate? With me? What's the best way for you? When I've been out here, I've heard some very interesting things. I've heard things along the lines of keeping a blog, so that people can kind of go to that and, hear, and keep people updated as to what's going on. I've also heard people starting to talk about having some town hall situations with board members, having the board member in your district and one or two of the at-large members showing up there to this meeting, letting you know what's going on, hearing from your questions, we can bounce some ideas back and forth. So I think that that might be one way to make sure that parents are feeling, and, and students and teachers are feeling like a little bit more back in the process again. It's gotta start just being some direct communication and then kind of listening to some of the suggestions that we're putting out there. I think that we need to be constantly exploring mechanisms for um, harnessing the feedback that already exists. I mean, our communities are fantastic at generating feedback and the communities know what they need, right? So it's not a problem of how do we generate feedback, it's how do we collect and harness that feedback. And I think that that needs to be a constant exploration because those mechanisms are always changing. But what it feels really poignant to me is that leadership must manage their expectations about how frequently and with how much consistency they are going to have to show up to do good work for our families, for our educators, for our communities before those folks are ready to explore what it might be like to trust MPS leadership again. It's a situation where man management and leadership and the board is going to have to take on that work of doing really good work for a long time before anybody sees it as good work. Because regaining trust means that you have to keep doing it even when people aren't ready to trust you yet. Thank you, so I'll pick up there, because you're talking about how long that's gonna take. It's gonna take a long time. This isn't gonna be an easy job, and the first few years is gonna be about rebuilding trust and repairing those relationships. Right now, I've, I've been out door knocking three or four days a week leading up to the primary, and every single person I talked to would talk to me about, I would say, what was your experience like with MPS? Well, they'd all start talking about the CDD. And then they would talk about their experiences with their kids and, and things that happened there. It's listening to people, and it is going to take time, just like Sonia was saying. It's going to take multiple different avenues like Colin was talking about. Just like when we're in the classroom, we don't just teach one way. We teach multiple ways to meet all the needs of our learners. Same with our community members. We're going to have to provide lots of different opportunities for community engagement because that's how it's, that's how we're going to get there with that long run. Thank you very much. One, please. Yeah, um, I have a question. Um, I, I oh, my name is Mark Valencia. Uh, three children and MPS. Um, what do you consider the three most important capabilities of the future superintendent? <laughs> I can go. Um, I would say 
uh, a strong understanding of racial equity and how to um, bring equity forward. Uh, and I would also say business acumen, somebody who really understands how to um, resolve some of our challenges financially that we're having as a district. Um, and creativity, I think really being able to be in a passionate person who has, um, is able to think outside of the box is going to be really essential. Thank you very much. What you with that? Um, um, the first two that came to mind for me is they've got to be community oriented. We want somebody who's in our, in our community who um, is invested in our community. We also want someone who's collaborative. We've had this um, authoritarian model that hasn't, it doesn't work. It's not working for us. And so how are we going to collaborate together? How are we going to hear the needs of our students and our teachers and our families if it's, I'm telling you do this. We're, so we've got to have that collaborative model. And I only came up with two real quick. I've got another one, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I agree with everything that we had just said, so it's difficult. I don't want to necessarily have to have to re repeat all of that. But again, someone who has, who has got that experience in an urban environment, I personally would like to see someone who's had a little bit of time in the classroom as well. I mean, not just someone who just has the degree and have worked in this uh, administrative office or anything, that's someone who actually remembers what it's like to be in the classroom. I'd like to see someone who takes time to actually go out there and work with our students and be with our students. There's a man who used to be the former superintendent in Philadelphia. I watched him work with these students and they formed a group that's sort of like the, um, uh, the Dare to Be Real group that we have for our students of color at our school. That superintendent was working directly with those students on a monthly basis. He was out there doing that. Those kind of engagements are what we have, and I want someone who has who, who loves Minneapolis and has a, and, and believes in Minneapolis and really wants the best for our community and understands what, what you know the situation that we're in, the trouble that we're in, and yes, they do need to have some business acumen. But um, I agree with everything that Lori has said. Thank you, Colin. So that was uh, yes. It's not a question. It's just. Uh, Thank you on behalf of the organizers, but also I want to tell you that it's so important to listen to you that we did have over 75 people connected via Zoom or Facebook Live to listen to what you were saying. So that important it is, and I want to remark that. And thank you all for being here. And we were here over 30, 33 people also, so more than 100 people listen to what you were saying. So you be very careful, you committed. Thank you so much. <laughs> so that, that concludes our, our, our questions. So I will make sure to give you 10 seconds each of you to display the conclusion. Just a 10 seconds. Before we wrap it up. I have a oh, no, oh, please, yes. yes, please. Um, well, everybody here is thoughtful, very dedicated, and I'm in admiration of what each of you have to say. The question I have for you is everyone is talking about, we have to spend time getting to know the legislatures, door knocking, it all takes time. Which of you has the time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's always the, the question. Um, yes, the school year just started for me now, so um, that door knocking time and all that time that I have is going to be um, it's really curtailed. Now, if, if elected, um, I will have to find a, a job in another district. And so, you know what, if that comes to pass, you know, there's some options that I have and some things that we're looking at, some things that we are working at, and there might be a possibility where I can find a job in a different district that might be a point eight position, or it might be a four day a week position that would give me an extra day or an extra time to do something. So those are just some of the ways that I'm thinking about trying to see if I can find some of that extra time. I know that my weekends are really shot, <laughs> no, <I'm, okay. laughs> but um, you know, I also I uh, when I was teaching down in Bloomington, I used to coach three sports as well, and so um, I'm used to having long evenings and spending a long time, you know, away from home, having to talk with people and doing whatever. So um, ready and willing to kind of do that if you have to. So um, do you want a little thirty second thing? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So since I'm up here, just uh, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate that. Again, my name is Colin Beachy, um, part of the Safe and Stable School Slate with Lori. Um, look, we've been, um, it's been a difficult couple of years as the question that I asked with everything that was going on. And so, um, it's just, I just feel like, just for me as a person, just based on my own personal background, my own educational background, my dedication to teaching, I believe, really makes me an excellent candidate for this, for this position. And I just, again, really appreciate everyone taking your time. 
I hope that I was able to earn some votes here tonight. And um, yeah, just thank you all. Appreciate thank it. You. Yes. To answer your question, I have the time. I have the time because um, I have a wife who supports me in all my endeavors and who has been working so hard to make sure our family has their needs met um, and my kids are okay so I can be off trying to do this work that would impact my family directly. So, Misha. Thank you so much, I love you. And um, I, you know, last year I went to 40 hours of IEP meetings, and that is more hours than my child received instruction last year. Um, I brought in the state to facilitate, to mediate, and after 24 hours of state facilitation and mediation, I have, we owe your child 250 hours of one-to-one -one instruction, and we'll figure out a plan for how he gets those eventually. There's no plan. I cannot, as a parent, let children who are brilliant, curious learners be facing those circumstances in our city. So I will be fighting this as long as there is a fight to be fought, and I thank you all for having me.
Mickey Mouse from uh, Eric. So I just want to thank you on behalf of um, our three organizations for um, coming here tonight, to the candidates for taking their time to um, have us learn from you. And um, it's just really good to have all these community uh, folks come out and uh, participate both online and in person. And um, Centro is closing, like they close the parking lot and everything. So I mean, if there isn't time to like socialize or grab food or anything, you really have to like head out. Um, so um, that's just kind of like